my Lumen and on Lemme Decor Skin and Well. This is a beautiful idiot we're gonna talk about in this video and I absolutely love it and in my opinion this is a true declaration of love. So um, if you wanna play it and enjoy the music while playing and forget about all the technical problems and freely express yourself through playing, then you have to follow this guide step by step to correctly analyze this piece. Um, I'm gonna talk here about musical enough expression that you can master in my piano well training program up there and it's um, it's beautiful program that if you practice one hour every day then you can play just like me or actually much better than me <laughs> all right let's go ahead I'm challenging myself today to make it as fast as possible <laughs> So it's not gonna last uh, over one hour. Let's see how it goes. Okay. As usually, try to find the bars, try to find the places where you should rearrange the notes because um, overstretching your hands may lead to unnecessary tension while playing. So we always want to keep our hands relaxed even though our head and our throat are worked 100%, our hands still relaxed. So uh, in the bar 8, 28 and 32, 33, 34, there are some notes that you simply can rearrange. So in this bar... with your right hand and B flat with your left hand. Now in 28, I'm simply, okay this is the bar. So I'm taking E flat with my right hand and G flat with my left hand. So I'm not again overlapping my hands here. Uh, 32 Not this, but this F with the right hand, E flat with the left hand F with the right hand, D flat with the left hand G with the right hand, E flat with the left hand Done here I think... Um, when Chopin actually wrote this, maybe he meant to kind of emphasize and make with more offered this interval in the left hand, you know? should have like kind of voicing this uh, so this is a chance for you guys to do this if you want um, really why would he overlap his hands I don't know um, and at the very end if you have noticed I'm not playing the long glissata, uh, long arpeggiata but I'm actually following my melody first and then I do the feeling I'm following my melody first. <laughs> so if you like that, guys, um, you may use it. If you don't, just drop it and do like everyone does. And next step is about pedal. I want to talk here. You know, in this edition, the pedal is written very detailed, and when you play it actually in the fast tempo, all these harmonies doesn't need to be so clear shown here by your pedal I mean there is really some bars and you can hold your pedal for the whole bar or half of the bar and that really does not make any blurry or cloudy harmonies here sounding here it doesn't mix harmonies it only creates this powerful beautiful aura of this etude 
by gaining some uh, harmonies by mixing them together. <laughs> um, I just want to, you can go ahead and uh, try it by myself. I just want to show you some places where uh, you definitely can hold the pedal for the whole bar. For example, uh, that would be which bar? 8, 9, 10, 11, 17. 17. So here. Oh, actually, before too, you know, 16. Hold it on one pedal. It's fine when you play, trust me. And um, the next word, the next part. One pedal. One pedal. One pedal. the music in our head. We're gonna choose the timbres that is suitable for this etude and even though Robert Schumann named this etude uh, like a wind harp, we still want to stick with the timbres that we are most famous about. I don't, I don't know, I, I went to this YouTube and I was trying to find this wind harp and all these harps seem to be like more, look more contemporary, how to say, like different from that harp. So I have no idea how that harm uh, sounded like. Anyways, um, I decided to choose strings and of course soprano and tenor in the melodies. So this one will be cellos, this one will be violins and melody in soprano. And sometimes when the left hand joins over here, I want to mention in this beautiful tenor voice. Okay, now uh, just to remind you that when we imagine sounds, we imagine glissando between sounds, we imagine sounds with movement to the right or to the left, according to the melody pattern. And in this case, well, there is a certain melody in the right hand, we cannot deny that. But if you follow the whole pattern, you know, like this, then that means that every time it comes to your fifth finger, you're gonna come to the right and basically if you play the, the melody that would be every time right 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 so this is a small chances for you to you know to start separating this melody because we want to make this beautiful melody if you if you noticed in my performance there, there was beautiful phrasing in the melody you know the melody was very flexible it really sounded like a voice, so this is one of the steps why it sounded this way because when I choose the movement for my hand and for my imagination of sound, I would go by the melody. That means I start right, but this, well, 
this note, I would dimension to the left and I would move my hand to the left. And even though this melody is hidden in this busy accompaniment, you have to do this. And this is how it would look like. So this one is classical, you know, right, left. sound in this etude, please for your right hand, for your fifth finger, choose the pattern that is following melody lines, not the whole texture lines. And with left hand, um, it's again as usually, like left, right, 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 left, 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 right, 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 left, 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 left all the time. <laughs> uh, in the end, Oh yeah, also I think this fire is nice. So I would do... Okay, this is the place. You see this melody? I would really go by this melody as well. So that would be left. you to find the uh, notes where you're gonna move your elbow. Again, in the very first step it might be very artificial, but when you play it fast, as you have already probably noticed from my performance, you cannot say that I know you know where exactly I move my elbow, everything looks very natural, but in the very first step you have to make it because this etude for a certain technique and this technique at is accuracy in big leaps <laughs> in the left hand and in the right hand and um, I don't need to explain where these leaps are everyone knows it <laughs> and everyone knows that as soon as we come closer to these bars in our mind we switch from you know beautiful uh, feeling that we have while playing to this fear okay <laughs> is it gonna be accurate <laughs> okay this is B C <laughs> so if you don't want to have this jerky feeling in your head, make sure you make your movement of elbow. That will make everything flexible, 100% accurately. Okay, well, 99% we still have to uh, turn on our mind when we play. And um, this is a note that I'm gonna choose. For my left hand, you see we have this set of six notes. And basically, I usually, move my elbow to the right on every second note and move my elbow to the left on every fifth note. This is what I mean. When I'm playing here, right, left, right, left. So this is the rule that I'm following in this etude. When it comes to this big leaps in the bass, of course I'm moving my elbow every time I come, I come from bass and every time I'm about to go to the bass. So here I will move my wrist left, but I will move my elbow to the right. And again, when I'm about to jump to the, to the bass, again, 
well, basically on the bass you always move your elbow to the right. And as you can see, again, I'm not stretching my hand, I'm not playing something, something like this. Oh my god, I already feel tired. <laughs> How people actually play this idiot if they don't use this technique? Okay, anyway, so it will help your hand again be always relaxed and closed. Left, right. Bar. A little bit different pattern in the left hand, so I'm moving my elbow here, right and left. Basically, in the set of four notes, I would I would move my elbow on the second note and first note. so small, so unnoticeable that you can barely see them, but it's all in the muscles here, it will stay in the muscles. And in the bar 32, you know, it comes big leaves, so to the right, left, right. Again, there is some pattern that you may follow. Well, if you play in one position, apparently you don't have to move your elbow, but as soon as it's going beyond this position, you change the position, that's what I'm doing. Again, in the set of six notes, I would move my elbow to the right on every fifth note, and I would move my elbow to the left on every first note. So, over here, for example, you're going a little bit beyond. I cannot stretch my hand to this. I mean, I can but I would prefer to keep it relaxed. So, it's definitely a new position for me. One, two, three, four, five to the right, one to the left. And again, where it's obvious, we're gonna change position big leaps, like here, elbow right, elbow left. Make sure you first move your wrist, then you move your elbow, it's very important. Because if you just move your elbow without your wrist, then um, the elbow will replace the movements of wrist and wrist will start being flexible and swimming. Follow this pattern guys, and in the very end, I'm moving my elbow every time I'm playing with second finger, in both hands, it's like similar motion. I also move my torso here because in order to play this very fluent and comfortable you have to move your torso very fast to the right. So I'm moving my elbow here and torso to the right. Right, right, left, left. Now here I'm moving on second note. Right, right, left, left. that you don't twist your wrist on the way, that you're really following right and left. You don't do this every time you play with your first finger, but we learned this in arpeggios already, so I hope it's not an issue for you. Left, left, right, left, right. So basically on every second and fifth note. Now, after I analyze this, of course, what I'm doing, I'm just taking the notes, you know, go to my sofa, lay down, and just staring in the notes, being away of the piano, spend some time imagining right hand first, because, oh well, this is so many notes, you have to separate them. Right hand first, with movement, with beautiful, like, uh, timbres, uh, melody in the soprano, the rest in the violins, and I'm making the sander. better legato in the future and 
then I'm imagining left hand the same way in the cellos. Then I would come to the piano and play it with separate hands, watching my wrist and elbow movement. Then I would come back to myself and imagine both hands. Again, if you have any issues with imagining both hands step like evenly, you know, um, then well, <laughs> ideally you have to imagine every note um, sequentially and then reduce time between them. Again guys, it really works. Like, literally, yesterday I was teaching a um, six, seven years old girl and we were about to make this stuff, imagining two notes this way. First I asked her to imagine two notes together and she was like, uh, I cannot. Then. I ask you to do this exercise, imagine, then reduce time, everything she does in her mind, and then eventually so would, and eventually would, and eventually two notes would sound in her hands eventually, uh, evenly. And she was like, uh uh, and I was like, oh yeah, <laughs> she got it. So uh, it works, guys, it's not just a theory, please do this. Because if we want to control every note while playing, because it's just ocean of this 16 notes inside, you have to be able to imagine two parts um, evenly in your mind. Not just like right hand better and left hand mostly blanks. You cannot really feel anything in the left hand. Um, so after I'm doing this job, I'm coming to the piano and what I'm doing, I'm not playing with any pedal, I'm not playing with any intonation or any nuances other than notes, imagination, wrist and elbow movement, and that would sound this way. so that would activate your fingertips. It feels absolutely different really when you just move your wrist and elbow without any imagination or when you turn on your mind and you start feeling some energy over here. So after that we're gonna play with intonation and weight which brings so much freedom so much air to our body, to our arms, to our sound and performance. So this is how it looks with intonation and weight. as usually <laughs> as in any other pieces is hidden in this harmonies so we're gonna listen to this harmony and when we listen the goal is to catch the aura of the sound the aura of this harmony the kind of smell of this you know <laughs> and uh, oh, we're gonna feel this emotional color of harmony and then imagine every note in this or in this color of harmonies that will improve our singing that will improve our touching that will improve our sound okay let's go ahead so first of all this is a flat major for me a flat major is of course the light harmony but it also full of warm light that you know comfort you it's a very peaceful harmony for me 
Um, so let's go ahead. Peaceful, it's not Chopin. There should be some, you know, <laughs> uh, waiting and some, <laughs> how to say, tension and a little bit of pain <laughs> and sadness. So. change my intonation and I would play it back to the piano I would play it um, with intonation and weight
one. <laughs> Challenge. Very fast. Today we're making very fast. <laughs> Now we're in the stage, when, and I'm in the stage, when I'm imagining every note in the dynamics and I voice some particular notes. Well, please, guys, follow the accurate dynamics here. If it's written piano, then you have to imagine, especially all the accompaniment, very soft, almost transparent, just like a cloud, all this stuff. I would imagine it back to my sofa <laughs> with in timber, in harmony, and in this super soft sounding with movement. And still I'm making the sound between notes and all the movements in it. And um, because I'm not gonna voice the melody so far, I imagine melody also soft, everything super soft. When it comes to crescendo, make a crescendo. When it comes to forte, make a forte. Um, when it comes to pianissimo or three piano, make it. <laughs> now, of course, in the very last stage, when you're gonna play it and you just forget about everything and just follow the floor and a little bit change everything that you did before, of course, you're not gonna use this like black and white colors maybe when it's forte you're not gonna make as forte as it's written um, but in the very first stage you have to make it so if i'm imagining everything in timber harmony and soft dynamics that will sound this way that controls my fingers and these muscles are in the palm of our hand um, and after that I would find out which which parts I want to voice and of course it's gonna be the melody here and sometimes you see no bold notes in the left hand um, and here also <laughs> General dynamics is piano. I told you before, we cannot make any dynamics without intonation. It would bring just, you know, tension if we do this without intonation. And this is another reason why in my performance the melody would flow, you know, um, 
far above the accompaniment. It wouldn't mix, you know, it wouldn't be like that. It doesn't sound that way, right? So this is why I make huge distance between melody and, and accompaniment here. Now I'm gonna, because we're talking about dynamics here, I'm gonna just connect it with another thing very quickly. Uh, in any piece that you play, and you need to play it on the piano and fast, at certain stage you have to play it slow and loud. <laughs> uh, because sometimes fingers just overplayed, you know, you, you stop feeling everything. So it's really helpful and I'm basically doing this when I've already finished all my um, analyzing analysis of this piece at the very last stage when I'm just learning and play it over and over again like hundreds of times, I would put this way of playing like uh, slow and, and loud every after every three or four times, like every four times I would play this piece. So if I play it twice, I would definitely, if I play it ten times, I would definitely twice or three times inside I would play it slow and loud. Uh, again, don't do this without any using of weight or intonation. That may hurt your hands. If you just play it, you know, just very stupid way, just, you know, loud. here you will even feel some pain here don't do this you should have done this playing through intonation so it's gonna sound this way through weight. If you don't use my system, don't do this. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, just one more time. I'm, I'm not sure if I actually said why I'm doing this. When you, when you play it uh, loud and slow this way, then when you come back and play it soft you would feel that you know all the hands start playing together and the notes that might have started disappearing before appearing again so you don't have to make any effort but your fingers would play much better when you play fast and soft <laughs> From next stage on, we're gonna play with pedal because we're imagining every note in sound texture. Again, take the notes, go away from the piano, and imagine every note in texture of deep water. And still, you make the sound between notes, and still, you're moving the sounds. Uh, that again brings so much freedom to your body, to your hands. To your intonation here uh, and to your performance. <laughs> together about sound would uh, look this way.
final product of particle sound imagination. Now in the next step we uh, need to analyze intervals to understand musical meaning of each interval, emotional meaning of each interval. And as we know, different intervals have different uh, meaning. And what I would suggest to you here, again, if we go by, if you go by melody, even though inside, you know, it's like fifth down, three up, six down, fourth up, three up, third up, and third, you kind of every time you come to third up to this melody, at least in the beginning. But don't feel it like third up because the melody is separate here. Do it like unison. Unison, second up, second down. Unison, second down, fifth up, second down, second up, second down. help you in the future to stick with the melody and to flow naturally with the melody. And in the middle part, I know there are so many notes here and I even try my best to understand each interval, but for me that really helped when I was just focus on some notes, not all of them. And basically again, in this set of six notes, I would pay attention to the interval that goes from the third note to the fourth note. So in both hands, in this interval, and I would feel that in the right hand I'm going to six down, in the left hand I'm going to third up, which is, by the way, a perfect meaning of this piece, because as we know, third and six means romantic and beauty. <laughs> uh, I mean, romance and beauty, so... Sometimes you will find fourth and seven, which would give more tension, you know. Sometimes some augmented, diminished intervals. Uh, you will see, guys. But basically, this is what I would do. I would pay attention to the melody pattern, and I would focus on this interval in this six, in this set of six notes. Especially here. In the melody, third up, six down, fourth up, second down, third up, six down. Then every step by second, octave, unison, the same. Now this one augmented fourth, and again by second. And as we know, second and seven is just request, asking, waiting intonation, tensed intonation. So if you go, guys, and analyze the melody, you will see how it's perfect. And at the very, the six, and down to second, five, three, a diminished fifth. Yes, also over here, I would go three, third up and fifth up. Third down, fifth down. Third up, fifth up. So basically it's just based on three and five. Three and five. So that's why if you go by musical speech, it's very easy to play it. Now, as we also know, musical speech help us to um, to reach this 100% accuracy in big leaps. So just make sure that every big leap you intonate with musical speech and especially in the left hand. Correct, good phrasing makes all the difference in this eater. 
again, um, if you notice, the melody was naturally flow in my performance in 80% because of good phrasing. <laughs> so, let's go ahead and analyze this phrasing. In this piece, one motif is one bar, and most of the time I come to the one, so because we start for one, two, three, for one, two, three, so, and we need to find the main motif, in the main interval in the motif, so I'm coming one, two, three, for one, two, three, then here I'm changing, I'm coming because he made, you know, this um, little crescendo with like little accent, which of course we don't make as an accent, we just interpret this as an intention that we come to three and again change for one, two, three. And I think here I'm going again to the last one. Then again, I come to and I again changing. <laughs> if you do like this, it really feels like like verses in the poem in the lyrics. Then in the next one, I always go to the three. Thank you. 
make more. Second more. Second more. 
So that would be the whole phrasing in this piece. <laughs> And if you follow this, if you express it through intonation, then music will flow, 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 flow in your performance. <laughs> Then, as usually, I will start playing with uh, emotional meaning, emotional image of this piece. I would play very slow, feeling the uh, energy of emotional image through vibrations of the distance um, between notes in this interval. And, you know, of course, we know the meaning of this piece. It's beautiful, we got it from the harmonies in the stage when we were listening to them. Uh, if I will play... I would play it as slow as this. Trying, trying to feel every little vibration of my emotional image in the in this intervals. Now also please analyze the performances in this piece and um, the uh, we needed to distribute energy while playing so our culmination and climax part would sound very bright and very intense and the rest was just prepare would be just, you know, like preparation for this combination part. So this is how, how I analyze the parts of form. Beginning starts from here. This part development. Rising to climax. Climax itself. And the rest is confusion. Developing, writing the climax, climax, and conclusion. <laughs> Again, everything we expressing in the uh, intonation through the distance between notes. That's why when we play with meaning of form, we can actually express it through performance. It's not just in our head. <laughs> and then I would play this piece with uh, emotional meaning, with form with phrasing, uh, following my sound imagination and correct reasonable movement. <laughs> so all together of course seems quite complicated, but when you do this step by step, when you master this technique, it's so easy, guys. Um, I honestly made this each during three or four days. It's just I, I cannot always, I cannot practice every day, I practice maybe two days a week. So that's why it takes me about two, three weeks to make it. <laughs> if I have a chance to practice like every day, I would make it much faster. Anyway, the next stage is when we imagine and feel internal pulsation while playing this piece. Uh, it's very important to, uh, again, I will tell you one more time, it's very important to uh, organized everything that we've done before in the limits of time. <laughs> um, so it wouldn't be like starting the space without time. <laughs> and I'm pulsating every crochet, every quarter in this bar. So when I would, um, when I tune into image of this piece with form, I would feel it in this time, I would feel this image in this heartbeat. And I must start to very slow and that would be very calm character 
and even though I would go with some rubatos, I would come back to the initial temple right away because I don't stop feeling this pulsation. I may stretch the time, but then I would come back. Um, many times I, I, I heard how students play, they would absolutely lose sense of time. They would start making this rubata every next bar, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, your form would fall apart right away of this piece. Uh, anyway, if you want to really play it in this tempo, one crochet 104, then you just feel it in quite lively, but not too lively, so it would be rush for you. So this is the balance for me, to really find the right tempo. And maybe sometimes you have to play a little bit slower than it's indicated in the score, just following this A flat major, which, as I told you before in the very first place, creates this kind of peaceful and comfortable, you know, the this is harmony that comforts you. So don't be too rushed to lose this feeling. Try to find this balance when you play it. I think that would be the tempo. a little bit because you have to feel it better you have to give more time in this distance between notes to bring up this culmination but then again you would come back to the initial tempo right away and that's it so the last stage is artistry this confidence while playing in front of the audience that has to be expressed in your intonation otherwise you will lose it while playing so um, in my last stage I would tune into the image of the piece with form I would feel it in the certain position and I was expressing this through this artistry and I would play it, you know, following phrasing, following my imagination. Again, putting some layers of playing slow and loud <laughs> as soon as I feel that I'm losing this sense of every single note while playing piano. So that's it about this etude. I, um, I know that everything I just said is very helpful for you guys and follow the system, analyze this etude and learn it this way and you will play it even better than I do. Thank you so much for watching. Have a brilliant day today. Bye-bye.